well, my first name is Jesse Millard Black, and I was born the uh, 26th of March, 1921, in uh, Titus County, Texas. Yeah, well, I was born and raised in East Texas, a little town called Mount Pleasant. And uh, as a kid, an airplane used to fly over all the time. And it was a mail plane. I think it was an old tri-motor plane. And the pilot was pretty low one day, and I waved at him, and he waved back. So he came in every day or two after that, and I always looked for him. And, uh, I wanted to be not a pilot, but I wanted to be a mechanic. And when I grew up, that's what I did. I joined the service to go to mechanic school because the only one that I could afford. They had a private school in uh, St. Louis, but it cost $3,000. I couldn't afford it back in the Depression. So I joined the service and had to take tests and all this, that, and the other, and I thought maybe I might uh, well wouldn't might, might not get into school. Had to take tests. Found out there were several people had been taking tests for ten, fifteen, twenty years to try to get into school, and they couldn't pass it. I was lucky I was just out of high school and did my test and passed it and was one of five people that went to school from our base. And I wanted to go to school so that I could go back and be a mechanic. Well, it didn't work out that way. Uh, they needed some instructors. War was coming on and they needed instructors. They were expanding the mechanic school and uh, they kept retained me as an instructor. This made me not feel too good and the school finally expanded and I went to uh, Wichita Falls, Texas to as an instructor, I'd already been an instructor at Chanute Field for quite some time. And the first chance I got to get out was to go to glider pilot training. And they didn't let that last but one day. Instructors could not, would not be accepted for training anymore, short instructors. So, one of my buddies and I, we got out and we went to uh, glider pilot training. And that lasted for quite some time. We went up into Kansas and uh, had our primary flight training in Hayes, Kansas. And then from there, we went to Amarillo for our uh, basic training which for the first time we'd seen a glider, all that stuff in Hayes was a uh, uh, light plane, single engine light plane stuff. And Did you know a pilot by the name of Ames? Oh yeah, he was one of the best pilots that I ever knew. He was, well, he was a natural born pilot, I would say. And to top it all off, he was from Ames, Iowa. And uh, that was his name. So I don't know if it had anything to do with his background or anything. But anyway, he was a character, good pilot. They called on him one time. We had a one pilot that they couldn't check out in the left seat. 
So uh, several people tried to check him out and he, he couldn't land the airplane. He was a good pilot, but he couldn't land it. And they, they asked Ames if he would take the guy up and he said, yeah, he'd take him. He did. He took him up, let the pilot, let him have the controls and said, I'm going in the back for just a minute. Uh, just keep on going. And he went back and bailed out. The guy made a beautiful landing. <laughs> and after that, he never had any trouble. And after basic training in Amarillo, we went to Lubbock uh, uh, to get our final glider training. And that didn't pan out, so they sent us out to California for that. So eventually we graduated as glider pilots and got assigned to a troop carrier outfit in Nebraska. And after that, overseas. Did you ever have any commando training? Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that, where it was? Well, we had about three months of commando training up at uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Had an old lieutenant colonel out of, uh, there was a paratroop that was ahead of the training program and he was a mean son of a gun. We did lots of stuff that we never thought we could do, like uh, taking a 10-mile hike every day, a 25-mile force march in the evening after we'd put a day in the field, trying to do all of our training that we had think it was odd, Jesse, as a, as a pilot to have to go through commando training? Did that seem part of your, did that seem logical to you? Uh, it didn't bother me. Whatever they wanted to do with me, they did. And I'd, I was kind of up for that. We had a war going on by that time, and I figured, well, let's get to it as fast as we can. Can you tell us uh, an approximate date when you were shipped to England? Yeah, I was shipped to England about October of uh, 43. And where were you stationed, and what were your duties? And Tell us a little bit about that part of your career. Oh, I don't know if that would be too interesting. Uh, it was just more military duty, that's all, training and so forth. And we fiddled around England for a while and training all the time until we, uh, until the invasion of France on June the 6th. We're getting close to your D-Day briefing. Uh, they're estimating what your glider losses are going to be. Do you want to take us into that frame? Yeah, well, if you Start with want to. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we're getting ready for uh, D-Day, and they called a briefing of all glider pilots. We went in, the first thing that the colonel said was, well, we've come to do, or the time has come to do what we came over to do. Said, now, we expect to lose 85% of our glider pilots. If there's anyone that uh, feels they don't want to take that odds, Please get up and walk out, and nobody will say a word. Well, nobody would get up and walk. I think if they had, everybody would have. 
because 85% is not a good odd. And uh, so we stayed. But we did, before the invasion, have a uh, at one of our briefings, uh, they told us that if any of us wanted to write a last letter to anyone at home, we could do that and give it to the adjutant. And if we didn't come back, uh, he would mail it for us. And uh, we started to write a letter. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, I'm not doing that. That's signing my death warrant. But there was three people did write a letter. And we lost three people out of our squadron. And that was the three that wrote letters. And that was that was not our 85 percent. What was the percent of loss? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. Three people out of eh, 50 some odd in our squadron. I, I don't know about the rest of the force. We had briefings, but when we left the briefing, we were surrounded by armed guards all the time for a week. I don't know why. You tell me why. I guess they didn't want word to get out that we were going to invade or where we were going or anything of that nature. I don't know. I was here to do or die, not to reason why. Did you have a day's delay, didn't you? Yeah, we had a day's delay on account of weather, but that's no problem. We just went back the next day. I was in that group, 13th glider, to go in. Would you mind uh, describing to us how your, the procedure involved in hooking onto your tow plane, where you left from, whether it was light or dark, what your control problems were, and tell us a little bit more about how you got that damn plane down. Can you start from when you left England? Well, you mean about how we hooked up to yeah, an airplane? The whole story, yeah. Well, we were on a, with the glider, we were towed by a C-47 with a tow rope that was about 300 feet long and uh, made out of nylon. It stretched another 50 feet, I guess, while we were being towed, because of quite a bit of weight and uh, stuff there, they, uh, we had two gliders towed by one C-47, and I was, I had a wingman, and he went with me, and, uh, we went across, we cut loose in France and landed. They drug us across about 100 feet above the treetops or something like that. When we got to the area where we were supposed to land, we just released ourselves from the tow plane and landed. So you could see where you were, it was, it was daylight now, was it? No, it was dark, civil twilight. And I think that's about the darkest time of day there is. We took off in the dark and we landed in the dark. And about all you could see was a dim outline of the hedgerows and stuff around, small fields over there. And we kind of got well, a little bit shot up on the way. Uh, had about 250 bullet holes in the glider when I got on the ground. And they had given us a 15-foot hedgerow to get over. And when we got there, it wasn't 15 feet. It was about 65 and was trees. And there was 
a machine gun on the other end of the field firing at us. And, uh, I didn't want to get too close to that, so I got down as quick as I could and I knocked the wings off of two airplanes, off of the airplane between two trees and I landed right close. The field was only about 600 feet across and uh, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Anyway, we finally got off and uh, when we went across the Cherbourg Peninsula, they picked us up and started firing at us. And we rode the cone of fire across the peninsula till we landed. And that's where I got all those holes in the airplane or in the glider. I went back and counted them afterwards. And they had been hit a few times. Some of it might have been after we landed, I don't know. It was quite hectic during those times. It seems kind of remarkable that you were able to land exactly where you were told to, not being able to see much. Well, I don't know why. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's what we were trained to do. We had some good training before we went in. You talk about coming in and landing and that uh, hedgerows were trees and Oh, it wasn't much rougher than most landings. It just was a quick stop. Well, I, I don't think any of the landings were smooth over there. We'd been trained to do things like that. However, we had uh, aerial photos that uh, we were using as to where we would land. And uh, they told us that the hedgerows around those Fields were only about 15 feet high. They were not. They were about trees that were about 65 feet high, I would say. I'm just wondering, when you actually got on the ground, you were talking about the machine gun at the other end of the field. Did you have to scramble to, to get out of the glider to take oh. cover? Well, the glider was a fabric-covered outfit, and I just took my left foot and kicked the side and went out the side onto the ground and it wasn't too bad. What kind of a weapon were you carrying yourself? I was carrying an M M32 rifle. I guess it was an M32. It's been so long I try to forget all those things. But uh, anyway, I had a rifle and a pistol, and I got back to England with the pistol. But I didn't get back with my M32. <laughs> what were you carrying into Normandy, in the glider? Well, we uh, carried airborne uh, glider infantry, and I happened to have a carry a Jeep and two uh, 37 millimeter, or I think that's what it was, uh, anti-tank weapons and uh, a lot of ammunition for for the uh, gun, of course. And then the other, I had a wingman that uh, landed right beside me. That he had the rest of the gun crew and the rest of the ammo, which about 1,500 rounds, maybe a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, ammunition and they were the infantry and we went with them after that and glad to be with them. Of course I made a mistake of walking in front of a tank that I didn't know was doing anything except moving along and they fired a round right over my head and just about knocked me to the ground but that was one of the things that we didn't worry about. <clears throat> With all the holes in your glider, was anybody hurt in there? Was anything damaged? Nothing except blew a left front tire on the Jeep. 
and that was from that machine gun that was firing right in front of me, right toward us, and it went between my legs to get the left uh, front tire. Did the infantry take care of that machine gun right away? Somebody did, I wouldn't say who. <laughs> After you landed and you were making your way back through St. Mary Gluse and everything, at, I'm assuming at this point you're behind enemy lines. How long was it before you were able to find American soldiers coming up to you? Well, we landed right in the middle of the paratroops that had been in there a little before us. Uh, they landed about 2 o'clock in the morning. We landed at 4 o'clock. And there was no uh, enemy lines. It was just all enemy territory. We landed right in the middle of it. Of course, the paratroops had done a pretty good job. We got out, became infantry, and went with the infantry boys. They were a pretty good crew. I say pretty good. They didn't let me get killed anyway. <laughs> Yeah, started back to, we were supposed to go back to England the best we could, and we did. Uh, we walked about 11 miles from St. Maria Glace uh, out to the beach to catch a plane. We'd be, we were strafed several times going down uh, on that 11 mile hike. I guess it's 11 miles, as someone said it was. And uh, as we came into St. Maria Gleese, uh, somebody shot to, oh, we had snipers in the tower of a church that sat in the middle of the uh, well, in the town. And in order to get rid of the snipers, they brought a tank in, set it up, fired, shot the top off of the off of the church. So we were we got rid of the snipers anyway. I say we, uh, the infantry did, mechanized infantry, and I got on out. I forgot to mention that I carried that machine gun that was firing at us. And they got so heavy that I didn't think it was worth messing with as a souvenir anymore. So I dropped it and let it go. It was a, not the best thing in the world to carry around anyway. Found out they wouldn't let me add it anyway. After you made your, after you became in effect an infantry member, part of that group. Uh, did your pilots have any meeting rendezvous? Did you try to get together to escape? Yeah, we were supposed to, and there, we had a rendezvous point to go to. And we all made it sooner or later. In a day or two, we got there. Uh, we didn't have much problem, uh, except They came along, someone came in and said, look, you better dig in tonight. We're expecting a counterattack. So everybody started to dig in. We knew what a foxhole was, but we had one guy in the outfit that didn't want to uh, dig a hole, so he just lay down, marked his body out with a stick and got down and dug it about six inches deep put the dirt up over it, lay down, yeah, it fit, and it didn't, it covered him from the direction they said we might get an attack. And uh, sure enough, we got one the next morning, and it lasted about 15 minutes. They dropped shells of all kind in on us, about a three or four acre field area. Uh, lasted about 15 minutes. We waited a little bit and figured we might as well take a look to see what was going on. And 
All we saw was one man bent over digging like crazy. And he dug down about six feet and back in about six feet and didn't come out all day. Now you, uh, your duty now, your responsibility, you and the other pilots was to make your way back to England. That's right. Was that an interesting, dangerous trip to the coast and what happened? Well, yeah, we went back to the, started back to the coast. They said it was about 11 miles. I'm not sure what the distance was, but uh, oh, we got strafed a time or two. With, we zigzagged in and out and managed to get through all right. We had to go through this little town of St. Maria Gleese, and that's where we, where this thing that I said I meant to go uh, came about. And then we went on out to the beach. And I met one kid going in by himself, had no weapon, no nothing, just a backpack. Ask him, he asked if we knew where a certain outfit was. Of course, we didn't know where they were. Uh, we didn't know where we were much. And uh, he said, I, I asked him, I said, you going up to the front? He said, well, I'm supposed to find this outfit. And I said, where's your rifle? He said, don't have one. He said, uh, I said, why? He said, they told me to pick one up off of a dead guy on the way in. And I said, well, you're not going to find one on a dead guy on the way in. Take mine. I'm leaving. <laughs> so I gave him my rifle, and I thought I was going to have to pay for it, but I didn't. I finally got out of paying for it. But, you know, it was issued to me. And, I was responsible for the rifle. By the way, um, we, we hear a lot about the uh, fields that were flooded. Did you see any of that in the Normandy area? Didn't see any flooded fields. It was cold as all get out at night. Cold? Yeah, at night. It get down to below freezing. You needed a coat in order to stay warm. Did you travel mostly at night or in the daytime getting back? Oh, in the daytime. Uh, they took care of things pretty pretty well, believe it or not. Uh, you can hear all kinds of stories about what they did and what they didn't do and how bad the Germans were. They were bad, but they were no worse than we were, I guess. They were just trying to do what their boss told them to do, and we were doing the same thing. And then come up survival of the fittest, I guess. So then, you're on the coast. How do you, how do you get from the coast of France to England? Well, we uh, had uh, LSTs that had brought the uh, infantry in the assault troops or whatever they were, and they were there and they took us out to an LST and we got aboard that and went back to England on the LST. You told me during that time that you saw a mine sweeper hit a mine and blow up and you saw the bombardment of the French coast oh, by the Navy. Oh, you want yes. to tell us all about that? Well, not much to tell, just the Navy was out there with some big ships and some big guns and uh, they turned broadside and started laying, I was told it was 16 inch shells up inland and they'd fire about three of those things at a time and it had just rocked the old ship sideways and almost covered up with smoke, but uh, they got the job done. The only really bad thing that happened was there was a minesweeper uh, 
working at the time. I guess they'd mined that uh, area, and he accidentally hit a mine, and it, I don't know what it did to him, but he went up and slid right back down into the water. And I didn't see any uh, people get off of the minesweeper. So I don't know if they were all drowned or if some of them were saved. I don't know. Jesse, you're making kind of light of all this. You had a terrible experience. Weren't you wounded? I haven't heard anything about your own suffering. And were you wounded? No. I was not wounded. I was one of the lucky ones. Okay. So we went back to England to do another mission, and they never did call on me to do one in the invasion portion of it anyway. How does it happen that, did you have any additional flights or was that the extent of your uh, glider experience on D-Day? No, that was it. Why? It didn't need us. You so we were finished. The war was over for us. You didn't have any other uh, glider missions at any other point in the camp? Oh, I had some, but we didn't make them. We went out with the uh, uh, Polish outfit, first Allied Airborne, and we were supposed to take them into Germany itself. And I'm glad we didn't make that mission because uh, sitting out at the glider waiting for time to go, they all had these three bladed knives that uh, they were sharpening and they were going for business. They weren't going to have a good time. And I wasn't ready for their business. <laughs> so that mission got scrubbed on account of weather and we never did make it. So essentially this war was over for us, for the glider pilots anyway. I find that very interesting. I didn't realize, I guess I should have, once you accomplish getting your cargo landed in the enemy zone, you've done your duty. That's about it. That was our mission. We did it and that was it. What did they do with you for the rest of the war? Oh, we trained. We might have another one. Who, who knew? Where were you reassigned then after? Tell us about the rest of your career. Well, the rest of the career. Well, we were training, and I had a glider fall on me. Uh, we were out training, and the glider, we were supposed to pull the thing, the tail down, and uh, I happened to be under it when it came down, and I got pinned in, went to the hospital. I came back to the States as a uh, hospital patient went into well, New York. We landed in New York and uh, wound up in El Paso, Texas. Uh, I'd gotten over my injury and what little injury I had, which was my back, and uh, I passed the physical and went to pilot training. which was, I don't guess I was needed because the war was over. Uh, D, uh, not D-Day, but uh, V-Day, Victory Day. I was still in training as a, uh, for a pilot and 
I got out shortly after that, out of service. After, took a job as a, a pilot, a tra uh, an instructor pilot out in Hayes, Kansas. That's where my wife lived. And uh, that lasted about two months. I working on a draw basis and a guarantee basis, 150 a month, plus so much for student training. And uh, the first month I did great. Second month I made my draw and I couldn't live on it. So I re-enlisted, re-enlisted as a master sergeant. And uh, went back into aircraft maintenance and spent the rest of my time in the service as a, uh, in aircraft maintenance. However, I was uh, in the reserve and I was a pilot, so I did uh, reserve pilot training uh, instructor for about a year. Weren't you uh, called to duty over in Korea? Yeah, I was in Korea. You gonna tell us about that? Not much to tell. <laughs> well, tell us what you can. <laughs> they took us over and uh, we went over with a bunch of F-86s and went to uh, an air base at Seoul, Korea, and we furnished, kept aircraft ready to go, uh, and the pilots took off every morning and headed north. They weren't supposed to go over the Yalu, but they did, some of them. But I won't get into that. Might not be a right thing to say. Right. Tell us what a line chief responsibilities are, Jesse. Well, he's responsible for the maintenance of the, all the aircraft in the squadron. We had about a hundred and some odd mechanics. He's over all the mechanics in the and the squadron. How long were you there? I was only there for about three months, and they needed some uh, someone for rear echelon maintenance back in Japan, so they sent me back to Japan for uh, to do all the rear echelon maintenance. That was battle damage that they could fly into from Korea to. Japan and uh, routine maintenance, uh, like inspections that came at certain intervals, and uh, they'd send aircraft back for that. And we maintained the aircraft, send them back to Korea in uh, fighting condition. How long were you in Japan, and was that kind of good duty? Uh, not really good duty. It was better than standing out on the uh, flight line in Korea with a rifle trying to work on an aircraft and snipers shooting at you. But uh, we didn't have that in Japan. But actually, it wasn't too good a duty. We were kind of in a Rice fields. Did you remain in the reserves through the years? Oh, for quite some time. I, uh, now, I, I was in the uh, active duty as an enlisted man, but then I was in the reserve with a commission. And that's why we, I continued to fly. What kind of a commission did you hold? Well, I retired as a chief master sergeant. And in the reserve, I had a major and retired as a reserve major. So when 
when uh, when did you actually leave the service for good? And uh, I, I left service in uh, uh, Jan January thirty first, nineteen seventy. I'd put in thirty years, a little over thirty years, and. Uh, it just felt like that the whole world lifted off my shoulder when I walked out the gate. Why? There's too much responsibility, or so much responsibility. I was a uh, maintenance superintendent of ADC at the time. That's Air Defense Command. And uh, there was, Lots of responsibility to that, and it, it just weighed on the guy. So I just was felt good about getting out. Do you have any reflections on uh, your career in the military, particularly in Europe or Korea, that you want to discuss? Oh, I could say over the time, I had nothing but an enjoyable career but I wouldn't give a plug nickel to live it over again. You certainly didn't enjoy landing in Normandy and... Oh, I was a young kid at that time and I was raring to go. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, what I was doing at the time, but the time was the, that time, not later. After you'd done it once, you were in no hurry to go back, were you? No, I was in no rush. <laughs> Jesse, does it bother you to reflect upon your military career? Sometimes it does. Tell me about it. No, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, fair enough. I still jump every time a gun fires, so. You do? Oh, yeah. Do you get together with some of your Well, not really. We did one year, and then it kind of fell apart after that. Family ever heard much of, of what your experiences were, or is it just other veterans that you might talk to? I don't talk about it much, and not to my family. They don't need to know. I'm kind of the old school. Don't ask if you don't need to know. And I don't need to know a lot of that stuff, and they don't need to know, so why do it? Jesse, you're gonna get a disc out of this with your story. Don't you think your family would enjoy knowing what you did? I possibly won't let them hear it. I'll tell you why she was <laughs> You know, those desks break pretty easy. <laughs> Did you get back to Texas quite a bit after you got out? Uh, not too much. We went occasionally on, until my parents passed away, and uh, after that it kind of slowed down. Of course, I went back occasionally for a I had a couple of brothers or three still living there, and then they died. And so there's no one there except nieces and nephews. They don't care about me. They got their own families. You have children, Jesse? Yeah, I've got one boy. And uh, he works for Shell Oil Company, or Shell Chemical in Houston right now. He's about ready to retire. Do you have anything else that you... No, I, I think I was just going back over here. He covered things really yeah, we, well. Yeah, we got through a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. Jesse. I think we're all done. Thank you so much. Okay. That was wonderful.